And this afternoon we have two very distinguished and qualified speakers to bring focus to the question of the debate, and that is, does God not exist? To my left, Mr. Dan Barker is a former evangelical Christian minister who preached for 19 years before giving up his faith in Jesus and belief in God. He received a degree in religion from Azusa Pacific, Azusa Pacific University, uh, was ordained to the ministry and served as an associate pastor in three California churches. He spent a total of two years as a missionary in Mexico and eight years as a cross-country evangelist. In 1983, following four to five years of deconversion thinking, Dan became an atheist. He now works as public relations director for the National Freedom from Religion Foundation in Madison, Wisconsin. As an aside, he's also married and has five children. Let's welcome Dan Barker. To my right, we have Hassanein Rajabali, who is the principal of the Tawheed Institute of New York. He's a popular speaker locally and has traveled worldwide to lecture on Islam. He is also a frequent lecturer at Columbia University on behalf of the Muslim Students Association. He has a master's degree in molecular biology from the University of Colorado and presently owns and operates an internet e-commerce company called NetSite Corp, based in Elmsford, New York. Hassanin has come to settle, Hassanin came to settle in the United States in 1975, emigrating from Tanzania, East Africa. Let's all welcome Hassanin Rajabal. And with that, I believe, gentlemen, you both know the rules of tonight's debate. If you have any questions, I'll just be seated at the side. And with that, I'd like to invite Mr. Barker to take it. Thank you, Muhammad, for that very entertaining introduction. Very nice. I also want to thank all the other organizers and inviters, especially Ali Kafan, who I thought was single-handedly putting this thing on, but I guess he's had a lot of help with Mohsen and uh, others. So it's very nice to be working with such gracious people as Ali and his helpers. He's also very generous and a very capable organizer, and I appreciate the opportunity to be a guest in this place. There are also some free thinkers here. There are some members of the Freedom From Religion Foundation here. I recognize Irving, who comes to everything in the country. There are members of the Atheists of New York, uh, another member who is uh, uh, a student at, uh, at Columbia University with some of the friends there. Richard Carrier is here. So welcome to you and thank you for coming. There are millions of good Americans who do not believe in a God. And on the planet, there's about a billion people who do not believe in any kind of a God. Most of them are Buddhists, but there are a lot of other non-religious people who don't believe in a God. I used to believe, as you know, I believed firmly and strongly. I was the devoted disciple of Jesus. I spent many years preaching, and I changed my mind. I can't tell you the whole story. I can show you my book. Uh, it's not for sale today, but it is available through uh, different sources. Losing Faith in Faith from Preacher to Atheist. Going from a firm Bible-believing Christian to an outspoken atheist. Or if you'd rather hear it in musical form, I have a CD called Friendly Neighborhood Atheist with 34 songs expressing in an artistic way my lack of belief and my pri pride of being an atheist and a humanist in this world. Now I am a very happy, moral person without belief. For me, the only guide to truth is reason. Not faith, not tradition, not authority, and not revelation. The only way to know what is true or false is through reason. Now, this is the Islamic Institute, and I'm so happy to have a chance to get acquainted with Ali and the others here, but I am not an expert on Islam. So if you want to score some points, Hassan, ask me some questions on the Quran, because uh, I've read much of the Quran, but I'm not as familiar with the Quran as I am with the Bible. But uh, if you do want some information that is critical of Islam specifically, and critical of the Quran, and criticism is good, we should all welcome criticism, because by meeting it, it strengthens our faith, doesn't it? I will recommend to you a wonderful book I just read. 
by Ibn Warak why I am not a Muslim. He was raised as a Muslim. He's a scholar. He's an Islamic scholar. He knows these things better than I do. So uh, if, it, if any of these things come up, I have to defer to his expertise. Hassan, you and I have a lot in common. A lot in common. When you say that there is no God but Allah, you are telling millions of good Hindus that Vishnu does not exist. Shiva, Devi do not exist. And I agree with you. You are right. Those gods do not exist. You and I are both unbelievers in those gods. When you say there is no God but Allah, you are telling a billion good Christians on this planet that not only is Jesus not God, he's not even the Son of God. And I agree with you. The Trinitarian God of Christianity does not exist. You and I are both in agreement. We are unbelievers in that God. When you say there is no God but Allah, you are telling the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Norsemen, the Mayans, the Aztecs through history, that Osiris and Zeus and Mercury, Thor, Quetzalcoatl, they do not exist. And I agree with you. You are right, Hassan. Those gods that were worshipped by millions of devout believers, those gods do not exist. The only difference between you and me is that I believe in one less god than you do. Basically, we are the same. We are unbelievers. Did you know that the early Christians were called unbelievers by the Romans? Because they did not believe in the true Roman gods. Although they had their god, they were called atheists. Atheism, in its most general sense, is the absence of a belief in a god or gods. Atheism, with a lowercase a, is not a belief system. It is not a creed. It is not a system of morality. It is simply the lack of of a belief in a God for whatever reason. Most agnostics are atheists by this broad definition because the word God could mean anything. And you can't possibly disprove the existence of something that is not clearly defined. However, when it comes to a particular definition of God, such as the Christian God or the Islamic God, I go further than just the negative soft lowercase atheism and I make the positive claim that that particular God does not exist. In that case, I am an uppercase atheist. Especially when it comes to the gods of the revealed religions. I am convinced and I claim to know that those gods, the Christian God, Allah, does not exist. It's not a belief, it is a claim of knowledge. The word God is minimally defined by the Abrahamic religions to be a personal being who created and maintains the universe, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. There are more to the definition, but in minimal sense, that is how God is defined, and that is the God we are debating tonight. Such a God is fictional. Such a God does not exist. First, I will give you my lowercase reasons, and then I will give you some positive uppercase a reasons for this claim. First of all, it's the lack of evidence. If there's anything that's obvious, it is that the existence of God is not obvious. Even the Bible says that. Truly, you are a God who hides himself. Because if there's a God, where is he or she or it? Now, some people say that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. But I disagree. If something is truly non-existent, then the only evidence we could possibly have for its non-existence would be the absence of evidence for its existence. The absence of evidence is not proof, but it is certainly evidence. If God is obvious, if God does exist, if there is evidence for him, then why are we having this debate? We don't debate things like gravity. We don't debate things like... Uh, you know, who is our president, or does Saudi Arabia exist as a country? We know these things by evidence. If there is a God, if there is evidence for a God, then why are there unbelievers? Why are there atheists? Are we just blind? Are we uh, just in inherently evil and we just want to close our eyes to something that others claim is so obvious? 
the very existence of a billion non-believers on this planet, it's not proof, but it is certainly evidence. I offer myself as Exhibit A. I do not believe in a God. It is not evident to me. It is not obvious to me. What if, what if scientists were to gather together every Sunday morning like Christians do in church and hold hands and bow their heads and pray and say, yes, gravity is real. I know that gravity is real. I will have faith. I will be strong. I know in my heart that what goes up must come down, down, down. What if they did that? You would think they were pretty insecure on the concept, wouldn't you? And that, that's what religious people are always doing. They're getting together. What if, what if scientists were to get together every Friday and bow to the north and say, there is no law but evolution, and Darwin is his prophet. There is no law but evolution, and Darwin is its prophet. What if they said that over and over and over and over again? Wouldn't you think they were somewhat insecure? They're trying to talk themselves into this thing for which there is no evidence. And that's what most religions do. They talk themselves into it without any actual evidence that they can show me. Um, or what if gravity is real and Isaac Newton is its prophet? Isaac Newton, probably the greatest mind of science. 300 years ago, he figured out the laws of gravity. Isaac Newton believed in a god. And when he figured out the laws of gravity and the orbits of the planet, the elliptical shapes and all that, it was a wonderful revelation to our world. Not by revelation, but of course by reason. He figured it out and he proved it with reason. But Isaac Newton was stymied. As great a mind as his, he bumped up against some things that he could not figure out. He did not have an answer for why all the planets were in the same plane. How could that be? Why? Or why they were all going in the same direction. And you know what the great scientific mind Isaac Newton said? He said, that is evidence of design in the universe. That is evidence of choice. That's proof of God, the fact that they're in the same plane and go the same direction. Well, we now know that Isaac Newton was wrong. We now know that this gap in his understanding does have an answer. We now understand something about the formation of solar systems and planetary systems. We now know why they're in the same plane in the same direction. But in his time, it was an unknowable thing. He had this huge gap in his mind, and he said, well, I don't know the answer, so God is the answer. There's a big gap, and he plugged it with his God. How convenient. He had a gap in his understanding. He plugged it with his God. And that's basically how the arguments for the existence of God have all boiled down. Christians and Islamic and Jewish theists and others argue, well, there's some gap in our current understanding of science, therefore I can plug my God into that gap. Years ago when it was thundering and lightning, they didn't know what caused it. So Zeus did it. Thor did it. But now we understand electricity and the weather patterns, and Zeus and Thor have died. They're gone. Except we do have a day of the week dedicated to Thor. Fertility of the soil. They used, to, they used to wonder, how do the, how does the crops grow? So they had a goddess named Hera. But now we understand more, and that gap is closed, and that god has died out. Now, I expect Hassan is going to give some of these arguments for the existence of his god, and I will re attempt to rebut them during my rebuttal time and attempt to show that many of these arguments are basically just god of the gaps. They're arguments from ignorance. I would also ask you, and I will ask you if I get a chance, Hassan, uh, if you do expect me to disprove God, then tell me what you would accept as a disproof. The principle of falsifiability, I think, is useful. It may not be 100% perfect, but it's useful. For any statement to be true, there must be things that can be said about that statement, which, if true, would make the statement false. And the failure to prove these falsifiable statements true strengthens the truth claim of the original statement. For example, if I'm a short, fat, redhead, you can say he's not a tall, skinny, blonde, right? And if I were a tall, skinny, blonde, it would falsify that I'm a short, fat, redhead, right? There have to be statements you can say about your claim which would falsify it if they were true. So I'm going to ask you, give me an example of a statement which, if true, would prove your hypothesis false. What would you accept as a disproof so that we're having a fair debate? Now, here's some positive arguments for the non-existence of God. Suppose God is defined as a married bachelor. 
Does he exist? Well, you don't ask, does he exist? You can just say he cannot exist. A married bachelor is, is discrepant. You can't have such a thing. And there are about a dozen different ways that God has been defined in the revealed religions that are mutually incompatible. Definitions of God that cannot exist in the same being. For example, here's a trivial, trivial example, and I will move on to a stronger one later, but here's a trivial example. If God is de defined as all-merciful, or infinitely merciful, as I've heard some uh, Muslims say, and if God is also defined as a just God, then such a being cannot exist. Because why? What does mercy mean? Mercy means that you give punishment with less severity than is deserved by the crime. You committed this crime, you deserve this punishment, but be merciful to me, God, and so God gives you less punishment. Maybe he sets you free. Maybe he's infinitely merciful. By the way, if God is infinitely merciful, then I'm not going to hell, right? If he's infinitely merciful, no one's going to go to hell. That's a side point. But to be just, what does it mean to be just? What is justice? Just means that you have punishment that fits the crime. You commit a crime, you get this punishment. That's justice, right? We want justice in the world. But if God is all merciful, infinitely merciful, then he can never be just. If God is ever just, only once even, then he cannot be all merciful. He has to be sometimes merciful and sometimes just, but he cannot be all merciful. So it follows, a God who is defined as all merciful and just, not only doesn't exist, but cannot exist. Here's a stronger one, though. God is defined as a personal being. To be a personal being, you have to be able to make decisions, which means you have to have a potential of uncertainty. Tomorrow I'm going to decide something, but before then I could change my mind, right? So I'm a free personal being because I have that ability, at least in principle, to change my mind. If I didn't have that ability, then I would not be a free agent, a personal being. But God is also defined as all-knowing. He's defined as omniscient, which means that not only does he know everything about the past, the present, and the future of everything, but he also knows all of his own future decisions. If God knows all of his own future decisions, and if the set of future facts is fixed by his omniscience, then that puts some limits on his power, doesn't it? He's not able to change his mind between now and then. He has to go like a robot or a computer program. He is stuck. If he knows the future, he can't change it. If he goes ahead and proves his power by changing it anyway, then he wasn't omniscient in the first place, was he? So this is a shorthand version of saying that a God who is defined as personal and all-knowing not only does not exist, such a God cannot exist. He either has freedom or he doesn't, and if he knows the future, he has no freedom. I call that the free will argument for the non-existence of God, or F-A-N-G for short. Another problem, another Mary Bachelor problem is the idea of an immaterial mind. All we know about minds is that they exist within some kind of a physical housing, a human brain or a computer or something. We have no evidence or no coherent definition of a mind or a spirit that can exist apart from something physical. Another evidence for the non-existence of God is that all these God believers claim, virtually without exception, that believing in God makes you a better person, makes you more moral. Believing in God is how you can live the good and right life. But when you look at the lives of believers, you don't see better lives. You don't see uh, Muslims are not more moral people than atheists. They don't love their children anymore. They don't provide for charity anymore. Uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews were just about the same. In fact, in America, non-believers score better than Christians do on a lot of these moral, charitable things. And if there is a God who gives us these absolute moral standards, then why do no believers agree on what they are? Take the death penalty, for example, or abortion rights, or gay rights, or, or euthanasia, or women's rights, or doctor-assisted suicide, or stem cell research, you name it you will find devout, praying God-believers falling on both sides of those issues. God-believers don't agree with each other. So where is this absolute morality? That doesn't disprove God, but it is an evidence against the existence of a God who gives us moral, moral standards. 
Another argument against the existence of God, of course, is the problem of evil. All you have to do is walk into any children's hospital and you know there is no God. Children are in pain, they are suffering, their parents are desperately praying for God to protect them. They're praying, Jesus or God or, or, or Elohim or whoever, protect my child, and the children die. They don't survive. Occasionally, according to uh, the statistics, some of them will get better, prayed for or not. And of course the believers think, well that's proof of prayer. But uh, uh, in my family we had a traumatic situation where my wife did survive, not because of invoking prayer, but because of invoking good medical attention. Um, on September 11th, Hassanain, those God believers who committed that act of terrorism uh, had a foreknowledge of the evil that they wanted to do. They had a belief in a God, in a, they had a belief in a heaven. And it's not only Muslims, but it's believers of all stripes who commit horrible acts. What if you had known what was in the mind of those, those terrorists? What if you had known about it in advance? And what if you had the ability to stop it without any risk to yourself? Would you have stopped them? I would have. I'm sure you're a good man and you would have stopped it. You would have stopped the bloodshed. You would have stopped the trauma. I would have as a good human moral person. If you say yes, you would have stopped it then you're nicer than God. Because God had the foreknowledge, God had the power to stop the brutality, but he did nothing about it. In my book, he is something of a moral accomplice. Also, uh, besides these evidences for God's non-existence, I don't see any need to believe in a God. You can live a good moral life, a happy life, a reasonable life, a compassionate life. Even Jesus said, they who are whole don't need a doctor. Well, most of us atheists consider that we are not sick. We are not sinners. We don't have this need for some master up there to whom we can bow as a slave. And we can live good lives without the belief in a God. So uh, my time is up, Muhammad tells me, and we will now move to the next phase. I'd like to invite Hassanain to come to the podium for his 10-minute rebuttal. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Uh, without taking too much time, I will make a formal introduction when I begin my presentation. But uh, due to lack of time to rebut, I will just spend a few moments in, uh, in just sort of listing these issues with regards to what my uh, my friend Dan has spoken about. It's very similar, as I see, that your arguments that you've brought forth with regards to the non-existence of God, as you have used in all your debates with the, such as, for example, with Fernandez and the other, others that you've debated with. And it seems that uh, you've got all the arguments laid out on your website, too. And it almost seems like a, um, a dogmatic presentation in trying to refute the existence of God. So let's go with, with the basics here. First you say that you use reason. Uh, absolutely, reason is a very necessary tool by which mankind needs to ascertain the realities. For if one were to remove reason from his tools, then he fails to, uh, to reach its goal. You say there's a billion people who are atheists. Well, I think you've taken it a little bit too far because a Buddhist is not an atheist. He is what we call a non-theist. He does not reject the existence of God. He simply defines it differently in a different manner, and we can discuss that later. When you say that uh, the claim of you, you say that you believe in the, your, you claim knowledge and not belief, I fail to understand how a person can come forward and say that there is no God and say that I don't have a belief. Uh, it's a claim of knowledge, you say, but it's not a belief. And I don't understand that difference. Uh, when you say lack of evidence, it's amazing that in all the debates that has been taking place between atheists, such as people like Bertrand Russell, as you all revere very much the atheists that do, you find that this argument of design is, is so conspicuous, it's staring and glaring in one's nose, yet you simply say, well, this is just to be discarded as just a mere existence of some 
primordial soup that came into existence out of nothing with nothing, by nothing, through total probabilistic gain, uh, which is absolutely impossible, impossible from all standards uh, of logic and reason, as we would say. So the interesting fact is that, yes, reason is a necessary entity, but something that is so prevalent, that is so clear about, about the system of design in the universe, and to reject it and simply say that it has no purpose, no design, no meaning, it just came out of, a, out of nothing, going nowhere, with no meaning, I think that is really, really stretching the, uh, um, the issue way beyond reason. It becomes totally unreasonable, and that's the question. So you asked me, you mentioned, for example, Isaac Newton. You said he was a great scientific mind, but he was wrong because he couldn't answer some of the things. No one denies that a human being, no matter how brilliant a mind is, can have an understanding of everything. That's not possible. There will always be some level of ignorance in the reality by which we live in. The universe is vast. It's not possible for us to understand everything. That does not preclude the fact, therefore, that I have to reject in a maker. When Isaac Newton said what he said, that maybe he was wrong, but he said there's a design, it did not imply that because he, he had, in other words, he knew 80%, 20% was not known, and on that 20%, because he did not know, he used that 20% as proof that God exists. That's not true. What he said is that there is a designer, but there is this much that I don't understand. Whether we fill the gap or we don't fill the gap has no relevance to the fact that the reality exists, that you haven't answered the rest of the question. Just because we don't know something does not imply it is not there. So when for someone says, if, if uh, Isaac Newton says something which he makes a wrong scientific judgment, and everybody makes judgments that are wrong in some time, but that does not imply that they therefore abandon their whole system. And I think that's where we're coming from. So when you say something is falsifiable, how do you prove, for example, how, what, what do I expect from you? The very basic question that we're debating this issue is if you and I did not exist, why would we be debating it? The question here has got nothing to do with anything further than our existence. We exist. We want to know where did we come from? What is our goal? You mentioned in all your debates, in your arguments, with regards that uh, you know, we, ha we are moral people, we're good people, we do good things, we give charity. I fail to understand why. Honestly, and I'd like if you can give me some explanation on that, why would you do that? You came from nothing, you have no goals, you're going nowhere, you have no goals. Why for this transient period of time are you so concerned about even coming forward and telling the world that God doesn't exist? I fail to understand that. Really, I'm, I'm being very, very uh, concise on this matter, but when you say it's falsifiable, falsify my existence. I challenge that. Tell me that I don't exist. Because the minute you discuss your existence and my existence, you and I have to go back and question the integrity where you come from. And that brings me to the next question. I've noticed, for example, that you, you speak about God. We call Allah God. What is Allah? Allah, by, from the Islamic perspective, means the God, the absolute, indivisible God. The Holy Quran says, ahad. Say God is unique, one. Allah is Samad. God is independent. Nothing depends. He depends on nothing. Everything depends on Him. Lam yalid. He does not beget, nor is He begotten, nor is He born. So for someone to say that God had a son or sons or sonship, as you mentioned, and we agreed on that, that we don't accept that. This absolute God has no frame of reference. Frame of reference implies something that is bound within time, matter, and space. The problem with these arguments is we keep constantly debating on the issue of bringing God to the relative world. The relative world cannot exist without an absolute creator, and that's the argument. You keep arguing on the issue of God in the relative sense. God is not transient. He is the necessary existence. We are the transient existence, meaning that you and I can exist or not exist. There is a there's an equal chance, as one would say, that a person who exists, who is dependent, cannot cause his own existence. It can tip either way. There has to be a higher necessary existence who is the immovable mover, who is not bound in time, matter, and space. So every time you ask questions about matter, is God a mind? Is he thinking? Does he have gray matter? That's, again, a matter of relative discussion. When we say that God is bound in time, how did he know tomorrow? Tomorrow is not a substantive matter to question about God. God has no tomorrow. He knows. His knowledge is infinite in the absolute sense of the word. And absolute cannot be defined, but we understand it indirectly for this relative universe can never exist without an absolute creator. 
You speak about infinite, infinitely merciful God. God is infinitely merciful. But you, the problem once again is you take one dimension of God, meaning the justice of God, and then you envision it in a pinhole mechanism in a relative sense. You compartmentalize his attribute, and that's where the problem comes. And that's typical, not only for yourself, but for even believers, even among Muslims. There are people who say, God is infinitely merciful. That means that everything I can do is okay, because in the end, he's going to forgive me anyway. But there are, from the Islamic perspective, 99 attributes given to God. The attributes are not separate entities of God. You and I as human beings are limited in our perceptions and concepts. We are compartmental creatures. We cannot think simultaneously multiple times in different dimensions at the same time. Thus the limitation is ours. And this infinite God is communicating to us due to our limitation. And our limitation should not imply therefore that we take our limitations and apply it on God. And that's a very clear indication that when I say God is merciful, when Quran says God is merciful and God is uh, just, these simultaneous characteristics cannot be compartmentalized. We must understand them holistically. And the holistic nature that we can understand and which the Quran tells us through revelation is sufficient to indicate that a universe that is so magnificent, that has endowed every creature with his power to exist, and even an atheist, as you know, yourself also, that when you become ill, you go to the hospital and get yourself fixed because life is very precious to you. It's amazing that you came from nowhere, you're going nowhere, yet life is so precious, you make every effort to make sure you live. And that alone is sufficient indication for man to say, what's wrong with you? Haven't you seen this wonderful system created in you? So when you say, you're talking about infinite mercy of God, yes, the mercy is infinite. The fact that you and I have this power to even discuss is the mercy of God. The fact that you and I have the power to reject is the mercy of God. The fact that you and I have the power to obey is the mercy of God. That's what we see as infinite mercy. When you say justice and mercy cannot exist together, that's once again, if you put it in a dimension of the relative world, it makes sense. But God is not relative, he's absolute. So thus, this question is, is not possible. Final point here. So when you say about evil, and I'll answer this question, you've asked this question even to all your previous people with regards to children dying, how would you have stopped him? Would you have stopped him? Yes, I'm under a trial. If I could have stopped September 11th, I would have. But God is not under trial, so it is irrelevant for him. Mr. Barker, for a five-minute response to this. Buddhists are lowercase a atheists. They don't overtly, positively reject a God, but they are atheists by the general definition of what it means to be without belief. I know this was a rebuttal, and I'm waiting to hear for your, your positive arguments. So uh, I'm, I might withhold some of my remarks until we hear your positive arguments. But your whole concept of design really illustrates my point about using a gap. The fact that we don't understand at this time all of the uh, nature of the design in the universe uh, does not give you the freedom to just plug that gap with your God. There are many people who feel like the universe is very poorly designed. There are many people who think there's a lot of cruelty and ugliness built into the universe, built into the human genome. There are some horribly designed sloppy things that are done with our system. So uh, to claim that the, the world is gloriously des uh, designed is, uh, is a burden of proof that you must share because many of us don't see it that way. We see ourselves as surviving in spite of the lack of design. Um, and Isaac Newton explicitly said that these two things that he did not understand were evidence of design. He said that. He said, he didn't say there was a gap in his understanding. He basically came out and said, this is evidence of choice. He was using the gap as evidence, which is what theists like to do, which is what you like to do. We like to find a gap in our understanding. The question is, what's going to happen someday when that gap closes? What's going to happen when we go, ah, we do now have a complete cosmological picture? When that happens, will you reject your belief in God? I doubt it. I think you're using these arguments more as an excuse to pretend to be intellectual. But if these gaps close, of course, you find some other reason. And of course, it's a relative discussion. We all know that the world we live in is relative. I'm not claiming any type of absolutes or even a transcendent, it's all relative. If you think there is some absolute frame of reference 
uh, in, in a theistic sense, then it's up to you to show that, not just assume that maybe it could happen. You, uh, during your opening statement, I, I assume you will give us evidence for, not just evidence for our ignorance, but evidence for your, um, your claim that there is this all-powerful being, personal being out there. And then you, you, one of your last comments underscored my opening statement quite nicely. Uh, another one of the incoherency arguments of God is that a, a, to be a person means that you have limits, right? I'm not a redhead. I'm not the big, tall, fat guy from Buffalo, New York. I'm, I'm, I am who I am, and we define ourselves by who we are, where we were born. We have limits, right? And our limits are what define us. But a being who has no limits, who is not compartmentalized, as you claim your Allah is, uh, cannot be said then to be a person, because there's no way to know what is not him. A person has to be a limited being in some way. So if God is infinite, if he is totally unlimited, then he is not a personal being. He is this infinite blob of nothingness, basically. You're defining him out of existence. To define God, you have to define what he is, not just what he is not. Thank you. We'll now have Hasnain Rajabali to speak for 20 minutes to present arguments for the existence of God. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I begin in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one who created everything with utmost perfection. There is no imperfection in his creation, and that which we see as imperfection is our own ignorance and not the system in itself. Thus, for someone to say that the universe is imperfect, one has to admit that it is their mind that does not conceive it properly, and the system that the mind does not conceive it properly is part of the perfect design. So for one to reject that would be tantamount to putting the horse in front of the cart. Uh, I mean the cart in front of the horse, excuse me. So the perspective here with regards to the uh, debate that we're having today is does God not exist? We put this burden of proof obviously on Mr. Dan Barker because it is essential that for us, in order for us to disprove the existence of God, one has to somehow, from the materialist perspective, come with an empirical observation and disprove the existence of God. One can say that, well, since I can't measure God, therefore there is no proof in the existence of God. Well, that is not reality. The fact is that we exist, and there's a higher dimension by which our existence comes from. Stephen Hawking, in his book, a Brief History of Time, mentions that, that that singularity at the point where this so-called Big Bang took place, as we know, we cannot go further than that Planck's wall of 1 times 10 to the minus 43, because all physical laws that we understand cease to exist. What brought about this grand universe? The universe which functions so intrinsically, so interwoven, inter, uh, that even scientists who study black holes out in the universe understand that they have an effect in my existence in this world. This concept of the anthropic universe, the Holy Quran upholds it very clearly. He says, Does, Do you not see that God has made for you subservient this whole universe? Whatever is in the heavens and in the earth, it has been made subservient to you. One might say, therefore, is the whole universe just for me? That is not the implication. The implication is that the universe has been created for my benefit also. Whether I'm the central figure or that is not an issue in this discussion today. But the question to say is the existence of God or the non-existence of God. Let's go further. When you say that the non-existence of God, how would you prove the non-existence of God? The fact that you and I exist is the question that you and I need to ask. How did we come? And this is the typical debate that takes it right to the very basics and says, where did we come from? There is uh, disagreement in all different schools of thought among the atheists themselves and the agnostics as to where did all this start? Is it a, sta a steady state uh, universe where the universe has always been here? Well, that's been disproven by the very founder, Fred Hoyle, 
So you find that that's not true. Is the universe expanding and contracting? Do we have an oscillating universe? That does not seem to show proof at all from reason and from empirical evidence that this universe is expanding and contracting with its mass that it, it, it cannot sustain itself. So the obvious question is we know the universe is expanding. We can see that. We, it, that's been observed. When you talk about the Doppler shift and you look at the red, the red shift, you can see that the universe is expanding. There is a constant expansion. This expansion has a direct implication on my existence on this Earth. When we talk about the, uh, the issue of design, you know, my friend Dan mentions that I haven't brought enough evidence. It is not my, my um, platform here to have to bring you an abundance of, uh, of arguments. There are plenty, plenty. It's books and vo voluminous. But the interesting irony is we don't even need that for the very existence of myself that functions and allows me to speak and do what I'm doing in this sphere of a grand universe where I have this capacity to produce sound and to breathe and to think simultaneously move and have depth of perception. If you're going to reject that as design, then you're begging the question. Because essentially then it doesn't become that convince me rather than saying, well, I'm, I, I'm not willing to be convinced because I want to shut my eyes and I want to be blind. So when you say that, uh, how can you prove the existence of God? First of all, we exist in this universe. The design and the probabilistic factors make it impossible scientifically and empirically for the universe to come into existence the way it did. In, in, with reference to Planck's wall, you find 1 times 10 to the minus 43, all the basic fundamental laws were set in motion. We talk about natural selection. This argument is constantly brought. Natural selection is an entity that is part of the great design. You seem to have taken this thing and taken a pinhole vision of how the engine in a, in, in a car does a combustion and said, that's it, that's all we need. We don't need to worry about the car itself. It's the combustion within the pistons that take place. It's sufficient for us. Well, okay, even if that is what, what you were what to take, that in itself is incredible design. So to reject design is once again begging the question. So, uh, you know, in all the arguments I've seen, in all the discussions that I've seen with regards to the debates that take space between the atheists, these issues of design that have been brought forth in numerous, numerous ways, okay, it's so sufficient that due to lack of time here, there's no need for us to bring it forth. But if you need it, we can certainly spend... 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever you need, and we can discuss all these aspects of design. And for you to refute even a single one of them and take it out of perspective and say it's not needed in this grand holistic universe, then we're begging the question once again. I will just spend very little, uh, uh, just going very quickly in describing our position as Muslims so that at least we are on a better platform so that there's no confusion here. When we talk about Islam, what does Islam say with regards to God? God is absolute. You asked this question just now. You say, Absolute frame of reference. A frame of reference implies that there is a position by which something is, for example, in science, I cannot say that this room is 500. 500 what? 500 yards, 500 miles, 500 kilo, uh, kilograms? What is it? What do you mean? I need a frame of reference. A human mind cannot function outside the frame of reference. It's impossible. And that's where our limitation lies. The fact that we are so bound within the frame of reference, we are having a problem in these discussions. But God is not bound in the frame of reference. He is the creator of time. Time is a creation of God. Matter is a creation of God. These are transient entities. Transient entities cannot come into existence by themselves. Nothing can come from, ex uh, nothing can exist from nothing with nothing by nothing. That's not possible. That means that our existence had to have pre-existed a, 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 what we call the necessary existence. In Arabic it is known as wajibul wujud. The necessary existence that brings forth all the transient mumkinul wujud into existence. And the, the, the mumkin can never demand its own existence, nor can it demand its own non-existence. It cannot. Okay, so that's very important to understand. So when we talk about frame of reference, we must clearly understand that every time we ask questions about God in time, knowing the future, we have to be very careful in how we're defining this terminology. For God's knowledge of the future, of my future, is absolute in His domain. He knows everything. But he's not bound in the time where he is experimenting himself, for he's not bound in space, time, or matter. Those are created entities which he has put into it. So for me to put him into it would be also very wrong. When you say that uh, uh, infinite blob of nothingness, okay, you've just contradicted yourself. When you say infinite blob of nothingness, that's a contradiction in statement. 
And I think it's, uh, it's just a matter of rhetoric, and I think that's basically what it stands. But let me spend a few moments here to explain with regards to the issue of evil, as you mentioned, and with regards to what is our position from the Islamic perspective. God created this universe out of his infinite mercy. Quran says, Katab Allah, Nafsi Rahma. He has made incumbent upon himself, it's metaphorical, that mercy is upon his creation. We are all creation. That's why when I began my presentation, I said, I begin in the name of God, the merciful, the beneficent. Now one might say, well, what kind of a merciful God is this who brings pain and difficulties and so on? Let me explain very briefly without taking too much time. First and foremost, we have been created to be tried. The Quran clearly states that, that mankind has been created for a trial. This trial is not for God to know, it is for man to know. So in other words, when I'm under trial, though God knows exactly what is going to happen to me, I am under that trial. And it is not for him to know, that he, it is not for him to know what I will do. When it comes to free will, let me explain. A human being has free will. He's been given total authority to choose his own destiny. But God already knows this. And knowledge of God about his free will does not imply the fact that because God knows, he has caused him to do it. Those are two separate entities because in the absolute realm, once again, it's not bound in time and we've got to take that into perspective. Into perspective. We are under a trial. Humankind has been created, has been endowed with intellect. The Quran mentions it beautifully. He says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ We have created man in a perfect form. We have created him. He says, what does it mean? He says, the Quran says, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَ This self, the soul that is in me, has been perfected. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And it has been taught wrong and right. That means when the common atheist says, I have these morals in me, I know what's wrong and what is right. Exactly. The Creator has planted that into your soul. And it is the beginning platform that if a human being says that you never communicated with me on the day of judgment, you say, no, no, that's not correct. It was already implanted in you, and you already knew what that moral goodness was. And when we discuss morality, you will see that this whole concept of free thinking and atheism as it stands, and agnosticism, really, I tell you, in, in, its, in its truest form, it is wiser for an atheist to say he's an agnostic than to come forward and say, uh, atheism, and, I, and I'll show that to you. As you mentioned yourself, you say, uh, we, we are not certain about this universe. We don't know. That I fail to understand how you can take a stand and say that there is no God. You yourself admit, you say that there is no design. We don't understand all the dimensions of it. So how come you've taken that step, leap forward, and say there is no God, therefore? You should subject yourself to the same scrutiny and say, I, I don't have all the evidence, therefore I can't make that leap of faith. A man comes to a holy prophet and says to him, he says, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. He says, why? He says, because I, don't, I, I believe that the universe has always existed and will always exist. There's no God. He says, why is that? He says, because I haven't seen a God create. He said, have you seen the universe always exist and will always exist? He said, no. He said, how come you've taken one side over the other? It is wiser for you to say, I don't know, and I will subject myself to further scrutiny than to take a stand and say there is none. Just because you've taken that stand, you don't have any evidence. In fact, if you look, it is very bold for someone to say there is no God, considering that you yourself are so bound with this in intrinsic system, which is so magnificent. I mean, I, I think that's the interesting thing, by the way, from the Quranic perspective, and when you read the Holy Quran, you will find there are very few verses with regards to the argument against the atheist. There are very few. In fact, the Quran just asks the question, how can you reject when you were created and you will die and you will be raised again. Do you not see? As my brother Abbas recited Surah Al-Rahman, he said, we created you. Which of my bounties will you belie me for? All these wonderful things we put for you. Which of my bounties? It is so inherent that there is no need to get into semantical arguments, polemical arguments, and then say, well, I need to debate this. But look, look at you. You've negated something that's so obvious. And as you mentioned, you know, in, in your... Um, presentation before, when you say, you know, if the Christians said, oh, gravity, come down, what comes up, what comes down? Yes, it's absurdity, precisely. That's the point from a believer, a theistic believer, that when you reject this fantastic design, that is absurdity from that perspective. So, uh, in, in retrospect, when we talk, when we talk about uh, uh, the whole concept of the Islamic perspective, we are under trial. We've been endowed with intellect, we've been endowed with free will, we've been given the choice to, re to accept and reject our own destiny. This is what the trial is all about. Now let me explain. When a teacher gives an exam, your, your implication is, why is there evil in this world? What is evil? From the Islamic perspective, there is no such thing as absolute evil. There is no such thing. 
Absolute evil does not exist. It's relative, and it changes its positions depending on which side you take and which angle of perspective you take. That which is wrong for one thing could be very good for another simultaneously. Just the same as in a relative frame of reference, I can say that I'm extremely huge to an atom, and I, at the same time, at the same moment, I'm extremely small with relations to the universe. At the same time, it depends on my frame of reference which things change positions. Thus, when we talk about relativity, which we are existing under, when we talk about good and evil, they take positions inside, but nothing in the universe is absolutely evil. There is no such thing. An absolutely perfect God does not create an imperfect system, nor is there such thing as evil in its absolute sense. I'll give you another example. Lies versus truth. You'd find lies, as in a common sense, is evil. To lie is evil. To speak the truth is good. You'll find lie cannot exist without the truth. Yet truth can exist without the lie. And I'll give you a simple example. If I say that I always lie, does it make sense? No. Because there is no essence of truth in my statement. Thus, it, it becomes nonsensical. Thus, truth is a necessary constituent to lies, because lies cannot exist without truth. But I can certainly say that I always speak the truth, or I sometimes speak the truth. It makes perfect sense because there's an element of truth in my statement, and thus my statement makes sense. So when it comes to the relative perspective within Islamic posi uh, position, that is what it means. That when Allah says, min sharri ma khalaq, by the evil or by that rejection which he has allowed. What does evil mean from the Islamic perspective? That which lacks good. It's just like darkness does not exist. You cannot measure darkness. It is lack of light that you can measure. You cannot measure coldness. It is lack of heat, because it is only heat that our sensors measure, not darkness. Darkness is a reaction to that which exists. So uh, from the perspective of Islam, it's, it's a relativistic position, and evil is a trial. When evil comes into play, would we say that when a teacher gives an exam, and each question has five multiple choices, and each question has five multiple choices, only one is the right answer and four are wrong. From that perspective, you would say one is the good answer because if you, use, if you select that answer, you get rewarded. If you select the other four, it's evil because you get punished by getting a, uh, a, a zero for that question. Now, would you say that the teacher is inherently evil for having put four evil answers to one good answer? Or would you say, therefore, that the exam is so preposterous that it absolutely evil absolutely outweighs the good would you say that a teacher therefore should remove all evil and make all the answers correct? In fact, you would say, you're fooling me. You are now shaking my own foundation that you are in fact insulting me. Either give me the exam and allow me the ability to select my own ways and to see the difference between good and bad. Otherwise, don't try me. Because trials, if you look, examinations are an inherent part of our existence. No human being on earth, be it a theist or a non-theist, exists outside the realm of, of an exam. We are being examined today by this debate. Why are we doing this? Because we want to find out that which is right and what is wrong. If the wrong did not exist, would we be able to debate? No. And when you say that we want to discuss this issue, absolutely. Discussion, bringing it forth, bringing the power of reason and having an open mind is very essential. But to condemn unequivocally just because one thing rejects to you that's a bit, you're pushing it a little too far. I, I like the academic discussion say, well, there is plenty of evidence here. Let's look at it further. But rather than just say, well, that's it. I don't want it. And the Quran mentions, he says, they reject it because they want it that way. They wish it that way. But the reality dawns upon them. And what the Quran is saying, and from the Islamic perspective, we are under trial. Evil is a relative entity, and it is a trial by which mankind should appreciate the good. When you see a child dying, yes, it is sad. But what if a child could not die? Let's take that perspective, that if you chop a, the head of a child, he's still alive. Put a bullet in a child, he's still alive. It's immune from all diseases. That would be, in fact, a state of, of preposterous uh, mentality. You say, what is, what is this? What system is this? That I can abuse a child and kick it like a rubber ball? Because no matter what you do with it, nothing happens to it. Well, if it did happen, oh, see, God is evil. He allowed the baby to die. So you're, it's a catch-22. It's a circular argument. No. The argument is that for you to appreciate a healthy baby, one needs to have a relative perspective by which to understand good. Good can never be understood without, without that which is not good existing simultaneously. We're relative creatures. That's how we understand things. And we can never have a conception of that which is bad until we understand what is good. That reality, that Coexistence is a necessity in this world. If one wants to say that evil should not exist, then the earth should not exist. You and I should not exist. A trial should not exist. An exam should not exist. Rather, we are in a system where we understand that evil is there. A lot of the evil that ha takes place on earth is man-made. It is not natural. 
If you look at natural disasters, such as an earthquake, an earthquake for the greater good is good for the earth. When it releases its heat from the center of the earth, and the fact that it shakes, it makes it it's good for the greater good. So would you say that we should eliminate all earthquakes and let man survive? No. For the Islamic perspective, this trial, this world is transient. It is a short time period. And within this trial, when you die, this is just the beginning of this existence. What follows after? Allah says many, many times in the Quran, He says, we created you from nothing. What is to prevent us from making you again? We can bring you back just like that and take you to, dim, to non-existence just like that. It means nothing to God. It is nothing. He says, you walk pri with pride thinking that you are so intelligent with your scientific observation. Look at a scientist. He's so proud. He's a great thinker. What has a great thinker done? Nothing except observe. Nothing. He has not created. He has not invented. He has just observed. When you see Isaac Newton observed gravitational forces, he simply observed and he became a great man. Imagine the one who put the gravity there. No. That's out of design, we say. We, we revere people. So when we talk about this, however we cut it, yes, however we cut it, we have to, we have to examine this. So from the perspective of Islam, Evil is something that is under trial. The Quran mentions that. Be patient and understand that your reality, your dogma, your system has a higher good. And your trials and tribulations in this world is part of this exam. In conclusion, you would never say that a teacher is evil when it examines a child. Nor does the teacher give an exam for the teacher to know what the student will do. No. The student goes to university and takes an exam for himself to know how well he is capable so that he can use that in order to get a better salary out in the real world. It is not for the teacher to know. So for one to say that God needs to know, right here is the very simplest example one can give, that in an exam without that which is evil, and it is not part of the system, it cannot be an exam. It is tantamount to removing that entire system. Thank you. Mr. Barker, 10 minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you, Hassan. You have a, a good gift of teaching, you're, and you're a good man. He is a good man. I think most religious people are good people. In spite of their holy book, they are good people. And I applaud all the good that Christians, Jews, and Muslims do in the world, Muslims do in the world. But I think your opening statement basically proved my point. And you also are attacking a straw man. I have never said there's no design in the universe. I have never said that I reject design. You must have been reading another debater somewhere. There is ample evidence of design in the universe. And we can account for that design in natural ways. There is design by natural selection. When you look at the ridges of a sand dune, when you look at the design of how molecules combine because of the limited number of ways geometrically they can come together, that's a certain design by the laws of nature. Yes, there is design. And your argument about design basically amounted to what I said it would in my opening statement a god of the gaps. What you are saying is that, basically, here's your word. Where did we come from? You gave that as evidence for God. Where did we come from? That's a question, right? That's not an evidence. That is a question. And then you have, surprisingly, you find this book, this ink on a page that tells you where we came from, and you plug that question with your particular brand of a god. Theists have been doing this for centuries, for millennia. They've been plugging that question with their god. So you have not given us evidence for a God. You've given us evidence for our ignorance. And I claim that there is a lot of design in the universe that can be explained in natural ways. And it is beautiful design. It is wonderful design. And it is right here in our own backyard. It's not some transcendent mystical thing out there. But think about what you're saying. If functional complexity and design if that requires a designer, right? You see a watch in the ground, oh, a designer or multiple designers made it. And the human mind is complex and look how we exist, we function, we feel, we are moral, we have, if all of this design that's within us, how our eyes function, that requires a higher designer than us because we could not have designed ourselves, right? Well, think about this. 
Is not the mind of Allah beautifully organized? Does it not function with purposes? Does it not have a goal? Does it not have some kind of an inner workings of desires and wants and needs and goals and purposes? Is it, is it not also beautifully designed? Or is it just some random jumble of transcendent ideas? If, in order for you to worship your God, you have to assume that your God is a purposeful being, that your God has a mind that functions in a logical way somehow. Your, your God makes a decision, affects that decision. It doesn't happen in reverse. There's some logic to it. The mind of your God is, as you say, beautiful, wonderful, organized. By your own reasoning then, if functional complexity requires a designer, then the functional complexity of your designer also requires a designer. God needs a designer himself. Otherwise, your logic is wrong in the first place. You have to, if your God's design does not require a designer, then neither do we. And it is you who is begging the question. Because suppose there is a God up there. God is sitting up wherever, in the seventh heaven or whatever it is, and God is saying, well, here I am. I'm here, and I have desires, and, and I think I'll create some worlds and people, but I exist, and according to you, we should not even question our own existence, right, without having some frame of reference outside of ourselves. What gives your God the freedom, then, to say, I exist, but I'm not going to question my frame of existence. I just exist. The logical question is, why? How? How did this God come into existence? If he does exist, if he is functionally complex, if he is beautiful, and if he acknowledges existence, then you are simply answering one mystery with another mystery. You're not answering the question. You're simply delaying the question. We don't understand our existence, therefore there's a designer up there. But the designer, if he or she asks that same question, comes to the same problem. We atheists prefer to stop with what we don't know. We don't prefer to unnecessarily multiply hypotheses to say, oh, there must be something greater, because it doesn't answer anything. It doesn't, it doesn't give us uh, uh, evidence for You say uh, in the Quran that we atheists reject it because we want it that way. That is untrue. The Quran is wrong to say that. I do not reject the belief in God because I want it that way. If there is a God, I will accept. I will believe. If there is a God, I would be foolish to ignore it. I don't want it that way. It's not a matter of what you want. And in fact, you seem to be betraying that there is a religious bias within people. Because I could say that you believe in God because you want it that way. That doesn't answer anything. That amounts to an ad hominem argument. You're attacking me as a person rather than the evidence by telling me that it's my inner weaknesses or my inner desires of not wanting God. That is unacceptable in a debate to attack your opponent's motives. If there's a God, uh, it doesn't matter if I want it or not. I want the evidence for that God to exist. You say nothing comes from nothing. Well, is God something? God, if God says nothing comes from nothing, but he's something, well, then how could he even exist? Think about this. How many ways are there for something to exist? Lots of ways, right? There's lots of ways for universes or something to exist. How many ways are there for nothing to exist? Only one. So which is more likely? That something exists or nothing? Why do we assume that reality, if left unperturbed, would somehow default to this state of nothingness, as if that were a thing? Obviously, something exists, and even if God exists, God is something and something exists. It, something existing is a brute fact of reality. The whole concept of nothingness is an incoherent concept in and of itself, even as you were pointing out. Somewhere we need to refer to some brute fact, and we atheists say, well, existence exists. It's here as far as we perceive it to exist. God is on trial. God claims to be omni-good. He claims to be all good. If a teacher in a classroom is giving an exam to a student and a teacher sees one of those students hurting in some way and refuses to help, then that teacher is guilty of some kind of an accessory to the continuation of that student's pain. Now, you admitted you would have stopped 9-11, and so would I, and so would everyone in this room have stopped it, right? So if your God is all good, he is on trial. Do you see the point of the problem of evil? He claims to be all good. And you claim that if you pray to him, he will answer your prayers, but repeatedly your prayers are not answered. He apparently cares more about the free will of Christian and Jewish and Islamic terrorists than he does about the human lives, those precious human lives who could have been saved. And you say it's a test that it could, evil is relative. So in God's mind, 9-11 could have been good. 
according to your reference, if evil is relative and it's just a uh, lack of good, then in, in God's mind, 9-11 could have been a good thing. You're telling us that there could be some mysterious higher way that something like that could have been justified. And I say that kind of thinking is morally bankrupt. To excuse anybody, your master, your slave master, your lord, your teacher, your god, because he or she is good and has a higher purpose, that is moral bankruptcy. It removes you from the field of criticism. It removes you from the ability to say, I disapprove, I denounce. I will say that if your God or the God of the Bible do exist, and if I am forced to meet him someday, then I will denounce him to his face. I will say you are a brutal God. I do not respect your actions. You caused harm and you could have avoided harm and you did not. As a moral being, I have an obligation to say that to a slave master who bosses me around, a slave master who tells me to bow down. So I think we naturalists have a firmer grasp of what it means to be moral than believers who just simply close their mind and say whatever the Father wants is what, what we get. You use the word judgment in your statement. And the word judgment basically boils down to heaven or hell, right? Again, I will say, heaven and hell. Hell is a threat. Hell is an intimidation. Do we want to burn? The Bible and the Quran are filled with these examples of, I'm going to get a double dose of hell because I'm an unbeliever, right? That's a threat. That is a threat to me. A physical intimidation on my person is what that book is, if I don't follow the way you people think. So I will repeat, any system of thought, any ideology that has to make its point by threatening violence, as the Bible does and as the Quran does, is a morally bankrupt system. We can find a natural way to be good to each other by minimizing harm in the natural world, by being kind to each other, by being good to each other in the natural world in ways that we know lessen harm. We don't need some daddy in the sky to tell us what to do. We all know it. We didn't need the Ten Commandments to tell us there was something wrong with killing. We could have figured it out on our own, and we did long before the Ten Commandments. Thank you. Hassan for five minutes before we take a short five minute break. Okay, in this five minutes, I'd just like to make some very quick points here. First and foremost, uh, when you say we want it from the Quran, that the atheist wants it, the want and the need is an inherent fact of all creatures. That is not what I say. What I say is the want for a believer to want to have an understanding of his own existence is equivalent to the one who is a non-theist or an atheist who wants to understand his existence too. The want is not in question. It's how we come to the conclusion is what I'm saying, that we want the conclusion. I'm not saying that we have a desire for want. I'm saying we want the conclusion. We are manufacturing the conclusion. In your rebuttal in the few minutes, it's amazing that you've completely ignored that entire issue of design. You're saying, yes, there is design. Yes, there is wonderful design. But I can say that that is natural selection or that is the natural movement. You know, it's interesting that you're accepting this incredible system, but you don't want to go further than natural selection. Natural selection is part of the greater. It's part, it's part of the greater. And you've, you have limited yourself within a scope of a, of, a, of a greater, and you've said, this is all I'm going to focus on. I'm going to ignore the greater. Natural selection cannot exist by itself. It cannot demand its own existence. It's part of the greater system. You don't want to answer that question. And I notice why, because the minute you do, you're going to have to question the integrity of where you come from. I have absolutely every right, just like every human being does, to find out where did we come from. For you to say that this is the, 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 uh, uh, the idea of gaps, okay, the God of the gaps, as you might say, when you talk about God of the gaps, for you to say that there is no God is also for you a gap. Also a gap, first of all. But I think your gap is much wider for one to say that because it's this incredible design, therefore there's no maker. Therefore there's no designer. But then you turn quickly and say, well, if there is a design and everything has a designer, therefore then the designer needs a designer. But I just told you before, but you didn't apparently understand. In the relative world, there is that transit nature of design system. But the absolute creator is the is the uh, immovable mover who is not bound in the design. You have not come to the absolute domain and challenged me on that perspective that this absolute God is not bound in time, matter, nor space, 
cannot be questioned in this integrity. And you keep questioning in that integrity. You're saying, God, you've written this article, Dear Theologian. I mean, honestly, uh, Dan, with all due respect, you say we're good people. We're good people. We atheists are good people. We're kind people. For what you write, have you ever taken consideration that there are those who believe in that theological ideology? That you're bashing them so face forwardly, almost in an instigating fact, uh, f uh, fashion, that you might say, well, how about me? How come I'm not so academic and say, you know what, this is what they say, and that's perfectly fine, rather than go and make satirical fun of God, that I'm so lonely up here, I know nothing, and if I read that dear theologian for you, uh, you've written it, but if the, if the public were to read it, really, to me, it's, it's very insulting. And I think an academician like yourself, and I really admire the fact that you come forward and you pose these questions, and I like your, 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 your pattern by which you're saying, I want to understand, and that's wonderful. And I respect you for that. And that's the reason I'm debating you. And the reason is that I think when the arguments come down and the substantive matter comes, like the Quran says, Kul hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadri. Tell them to bring the proof if they are real. If they are truthful, bring the proof on the table, put it there. Here he said, nothing comes from nothing. I did not say that. I said, nothing comes from nothing with nothing by nothing. That is what I say. I did not say nothing comes from nothing. I said nothing comes from nothing with nothing by nothing. So you misquoted me there. You say teacher versus God. You say teacher, God is on trial. Once again, you put God in the relative world, therefore you put him under trial. God is the absolute creator. He is not under trial. He has no deficiency. So for you to say that he needs to go on a trial implies that there's a deficiency. And that's not, a, that's a, that's, that's not acceptable. Uh, you're saying that I don't accept God because he's forcing me to bow. You're a naturalist. It's interesting. You're bound by gravitational forces. You're bound by your gender to be a male. You're bound by the two eyes. Why aren't you angry with that? Why don't you say, I'm a male, and I've been forced by natural laws to be a male, to breathe oxygen. I cannot breathe nitrogen. I cannot breathe underwater. Okay? I cannot reverse my time. I cannot reverse my age. I cannot stop my birth. Why aren't you angry with those things? You say, no, I'm a naturalist. I love this thing. And I fail to understand that. <laughs> This brings to a close the first half of today's program. Uh, just before everyone gets up, I have a quick announcement to make. Um, because there are so many people here today, and again, it's a really great pleasure to see so many people, what we're going to do to avoid crowd control issues at the door is we're going to have refreshments served in your seats. Feel free to stand up, stretch. Um, do aerobics, whatever you feel like doing. Um, just, uh, and it's going to be a five-minute break. Again, that's five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and visitors, thank you once again. We'd like to make this reconvening process as smooth and as quick as possible, so everyone please take your seats. Everyone please take your seats. I'm going to explain right now how the question and answer session is going to begin. We have approximately 30 minutes for this question and answer session. And rather than people standing up from the audience and addressing the speakers directly, in the interest of fairness, we have volunteers that I believe are pacing the sides of the aisles with paper and pencils for you to write down questions and submit them again to the volunteers at the side who will then bring them up to the front where, time, time permitting, we will answer as many of them as we can. Please accept our apologies in advance if we don't get to every question. 30 minutes is not a long amount of time. Each question will also have each question will also have a time limit for the speakers which will be announced before the question is read. Two minutes? To ask the Two minutes? One, minute for the One minute for the rebuttal? Okay. The first question that we have is for Dan Barker and this is a two-minute response plus a one-minute rebuttal from Hassanein. The question is as follows. You have stated that you're a moral person. What is the foundation for your morality? 
Where do you derive your morals from, and what evidence can you provide to prove that your moral system is good slash correct? Two minutes, please. By definition, morality means the lessening of harm. If people increase harm, by definition, they are immoral. If, it's, if they unnecessarily increase harm in the world, they are immoral people. We can use the word evil as a kind of a tag for that. Morality, by definition, then, is the minimizing of harm. That's what we all mean. If you do things that make harm less, then you are a moral person. And as a corollary, we can also say enhancing life is also nice, a compassion and adding to understanding. So if morality is basically the minimizing of harm, none of us want to hurt, do we? We all want to have, raise our families. We all want to be free of pain and of coercion. Then the question becomes not where do we get these absolute principles. The question becomes how do we identify harm? What is harm? Harm is a natural thing. Har and its identification and its avoidance are natural exercises. If this were a cup full of arsenic and I handed it to Hassan, then that would be a, a harmful act. But if it's a glass of water and I hand it to him, well, then that would be a good act if he's thirsty. I assume he's thirsty. So harm is, is relative to our human natures and the environment we live in, and its avoidance is a natural exercise. And most of us... Uh, have good enough minds, unless you're, unless you're unhealthy in some way, we have good enough minds to know how to, to do that. It's, and, and a lot of it is just common sense. Of course, most moral dilemmas involve a conflict of values. It's not always just should I do this or shouldn't I, but should I do this or should I do this? I have two or more courses of action, in which case it becomes an exercise of assessing the relative merits of the various consequences of those acts and trying seconds. to decide which one of those uh, leads to the less amount of harm. And it, even if you fail, if you intend to lessen harm in the world, you can be called a moral person. The problem with absolutist Five morality seconds. is that uh, you you will do what is right or wrong because of some absolute mandate. Time not is because up, you Parker. evaluated the consequences. Mm -hmm. One minute reply. Well, first of all, I have a difficult understanding with your uh, definition of morality. It seems to be very self-centered morality where the individual, I am good, therefore the world is good. I like good things, therefore the world likes good things. And this ideology of morality that's self-centered can never be a social ideology that can never be legislated on the, on the sphere of uh, social beings. You, for example, in your website say, there is no universal moral urge, you say, and not all ethical systems agree. Polygamy, for example, human sacrifice, cannibalism, wife beating, all these are perfectly moral actions in certain cultures. Is God confused? Your implication, therefore, is polygamy is wrong. Okay, so it's got nothing to do with harm. If a woman wants to, if uh, uh, three women get married to one man, to you, that's not uh, that's harm. I don't understand how you came up with that conclusion. But when you say, for example, uh, ten seconds. Yeah, to call God non uh, is is contradictory. We, uh, there is no higher moral good that comes from this ideology, and it can never be legislated. Therefore, time up. Our next question is to Hassanin Rajabali. And this is a two-minute response, and again, a one-minute rebuttal. <clears throat> Why is it necessary to believe in God? Won't God treat all equally good men equally, regardless of race, sex, or creed? God creates everything with perfect uh, creation. It's a perfect creation. Everybody's been endowed with their abilities. You find insects are able to protect their own environments and able to live. Animals have their own environments by which to live. If you observe all the discovery channels today where all these... Uh, interesting videos that are being displayed today shows this grand scheme of things where this creator has endowed every creature with the ability to sustain its life and therefore is able to procreate and able to sustain in this incredible universe. So the existence of God is a necessity because as I say, I and everything in this universe is a transient existence. It cannot demand its own existence, therefore it requires what we call a necessary existence, and that is the one that has brought into our existence. So do we need God? Yes, not only for our own existence, but our moral codes are derived from that too. There is a higher, longer uh, uh, focus for a human being, there's ethical standards, that that which I do today is accountable in the hereafter. Whereas for non an unbeliever, an atheist says, I can do whatever, in other words, do, uh, committing a perfect crime is a good deed. As long as you don't get caught, it's fine. I think that misses the point of the question. If, if I am a good and moral person by your standards, if you judge me to be a good moral person, 
but I don't believe in a God. Uh, is it right then for your God to punish me for the simple fact of unbelief in him, if I am a good and moral person? That was the question that was being asked. Why is it necessary to believe if we can live good lives? And you have to admit that many atheists and agnostics live good lives, and many theists live horrible lives, right? Many people who believe in God live horrible lives. So the question really is, why should I be punished in an eternal hell for simply living a good moral life as you live? That is unfair. Any God who has that type of a system is, is not a good God. It's not worthy of my worship. The next question is to Hassanein Rajabali. And this is a two-minute response and a one-minute rebuttal again. Why do Muslims need to follow a book of religion if there is a God? Wouldn't there be some real signs and absolute directions to man and God outwardly accepting responsibility for his actions? God creates a system where he gives man free will, and that free will allows him to decipher wrong from right. The differences that we have in opinion is a prime reason to show that there is free will. For if everybody was thinking the same way, and there would be no ambiguity in any, in, in any issue, that the implication would be that it's a defeated purpose for the exam itself is not under its truest form of exam. And you know, in any exam, the greater the difficulty of the exam, the greater the value of the exam. For if that student passes, that, that student deserves a greater reward. So when you say that there's a moral God, when we talk about this, this, uh, uh, this God that we, that we follow, he gives us the laws. Divine laws are essential, what we call our guiding light. An individual who says, I'm good, like Dan says, I'm a good person, there's nothing wrong with me, why would God punish me? If a student goes into class and refuses to observe the rules of the exam, and says, but I'm a good student, Okay, will the teacher say, since you're so good, but since you're rejecting the way of the exam, it's okay, I'll pass you? I don't understand that. My response is that I am only, I am being condemned to an eternity in hell for the simple fact that I do not believe, not for something that I've done. Atheists and agnostics and humanists say that people should be judged by their actions, not by their beliefs. Beliefs don't make you a good person. There are many devout believers who commit horrible actions. So uh, it, is, it is wrong, again, to say that just because I don't believe is that somehow breaking a rule. What sense is there in having a rule that says believe when you can, you can still take the exam without believing that there's some great exam maker in the sky? You can still get the questions right, can't you? You can still live a good life without the belief. I live a good life without the belief in your God. And yet your God wants to punish me forever for the simple act of not believing in his existence. That's unfair. The next question is to Mr. Barker. And again, it's a two-minute response and a one-minute rebuttal. Science cannot and will not ever explain everything. Thus, there will always be a god of the gaps. Don't you agree? Well, um, yeah, except science is closing a lot of doors. There were some questions that, we, that were open. For example, Darwin did not understand genetics. He did not understand the DNA. And if Darwin had, he would have closed a gap in his mind. He was confused. And yet we have closed some of those gaps. And science is progressing. And who was Isaac Newton to say that we would never understand the formation of planetary systems? And who was Hassanein to say that we have now reached the end of knowledge? All of these gaps uh, will never be closed again. Uh, I'll ask you the same question I asked you before. What happens when those gaps are closed? What happens when we do have a perfectly natural cosmological explanation for the origin of the universe? Then will you reject your belief in God? What happens when we do have a perfectly natural understanding of design uh, apart from the question of whether it's relative or absolute? Then when that gap is closed, will you reject your belief in a God? Is it really an honest argument you're making or are you coming to the argument with your belief in God first looking for gaps to plug? So sure, science doesn't know. I mean, there, there's a million things we don't know. That's what drives science. If we didn't have that uncertainty, then science would not be driven. And, Atheists and agnostics welcome the uncertainty. We like not knowing. We don't have to invent some answer. We like having debate and argument and disagreement because that's what drives the pursuit of truth. What you're saying, first of all, with regards to uh, science, you have taken the assumption that science answers everything. How does science answer the power of reason? How does science answer the power of love, power of hate, 
uh, ethical questions, morality. Where in science, within the, fi within the five senses and empirical observation, can you tell me that science has ever delved into the question of moral ethics? You can't. Science is limited. The reason I'm saying that you can never get the answer is if you've limited yourself within the certain set of tools which are in itself limited, and then you're saying that only this tool is going to give me the answer when in itself it's limited, then I can say with, without any hesitation that you will never get the answer. Because first and foremost, science is limited within its scope. That's why you find scientists do not talk about the existence of God, because within the empirical observations, you're not allowed to. Even Stephen Hawking says that. He says this is Ten something seconds. for the philosophers to talk about. We scientists are just simply empirical observers. What you make out of it is your issue. The next question is for Hassan and Rajivali. If humans need a reference to go forward, then shouldn't God come within that reference for us to understand him? God is the absolute creator. He has no frame of reference. Thus, to put him in a frame of reference implies that he is limited, and God is not limited, and therefore he's not within that scope of reference. For you and I, as, as, as our prophet says, Man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. If you know yourself, you will know your Lord. And that power of self-introspection and knowing who you are in an indirect fashion is sufficient evidence. Even Dan himself says that an indirect fashion of reasonable thinking, where you use logical explanations in an indirect fashion, you can ascertain things. For example, someone says, I love you. Well, can you define it? Can you display it to me? Is it quantified? Can you ever observe it? Never. It comes in an indirect fashion when someone sacrifices themselves under difficult condition. He said, aha, that person loves me. No one has rejected the existence of love, but it's not a directly observable entity, the same as the power of reason, and there are many, many entities as such that are not directly observ observable, and sufficient evidence is to say that the relative entity cannot exist by itself without the absolute. The absolute has no frame of reference, thus to de defi defy the system and to say that God, therefore, should be relative, Okay, is begging the question. Because when you say that, you say, why doesn't God come in the human form? Okay, when he, let us say, it's a, it's a ridiculous question, but let us say for argument's sake, yes. If he came, what would be the requirements of this human, quote unquote God, that you will approve of? You'll say, oh, he has two eyes? No, I wish he had three eyes. If he had three eyes, I'd worship him. Okay, he has three eyes? No, he has four eyes. If he has no eyes, oh, he has no eyes. So you now you see, what you want to do is essentially you want to bring him down to the relative world so that you can deny him. And that's the problem that God is not a relative entity, the fact that he's absolute overwhelms the human mind and that is sufficient for one to submit. One minute, Mr. Burton. I disagree. Love can be observed. It can be studied. It can be measured. Love is a verb. It's an action. If I am abusing my wife, there's an indication that I don't love her. If I am burning my children with fire, there is an indication that I do not love them. The fact that I provide their needs, that I meet them, that I spend time with them. Love is something that we do observe and measure. Many scientists are, uh, are addressing the moral questions. You're wrong to say that science doesn't address moral questions. I'm not, right now I'm reading Matt Ridley's book, The Origin of Virtue. I just read Stephen Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, addressing the human nature uh, instinct to compassion and to uh, reciprocal altruism and the evolutionary genetic advantages to those things within our species. Science does address those things and does come up with good answers for what you think are mysterious questions. The next question is to Mr. Barker. Just a reminder, both of you have, when, when you address the question, you have two minutes to respond. And oh, well, one we, minute. but no, we don't have to take the phone. No, you don't have to take it. Okay. okay. Just so that you're aware. The question reads as follows. If an atheist can live by a moral code, then how do you explain the killing of millions of human beings by the greatest atheist of all time, Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, Hitler, etc.? Well, most atheists do not say they live by a moral code. A code is something that's codified. It's a list. Like you have a list of Ten Commandments of do this or don't do that. Few atheists would say they live by a moral code. Most of us say we live by moral principles. And as I elaborated earlier, the principle of minimizing harm in the natural world is a principle that works for us. That's what morality means. Yes, uh, atheists have done horrible things. No one denies that. Uh, atheism is not a creed. It's not a religion. Uh, just as uh, many Christians are shocked at how uh, some of their uh, co-believers have murdered abortion doctors, you know, and say that doesn't represent all Christians, 
But think about Stalin, for example, who was seminary trained, or think about Hitler, who was a Christian, a member of the Catholic Church. Think about some of these people. Were they doing it in the name of atheism to promote atheism, or were they doing it for political reasons? Were they, were they brutal tyrants for political, personal gain? Of course, a atheism is not pretend to make you a better person. Atheism never says that. Atheism is simply the absence of a religion. But some of us atheists feel that the absence of religion is still superior to the presence of an absolutistic moral code in which if a god says kill, you should kill, and it's right because god says it's right, that's immoral. So um, uh, I'm not going to try to excuse a uh, Stalin or Pol Pot or them. I'm going to denounce them as well. Atheist or not, I'm going to de denounce those actions as immoral because they cause unnecessary harm. Well, first of all, the question is that when you, you cannot legislate what you just said. You say that the moral code, we don't have a moral code. So how did, you, how did you condemn it? You condemned it on an individual level, not on a social level. You can never legislate this condemnation because what Stalin and what Marx did has no correlation to your any, any base because you don't have any moral codes. So how can you legislate it? How can you vociferously say, Dan Barker may say yes, Another atheist may say, no, what, what Stalin did was very good. This is what the anarchistic mentality that a appears as a result of a person who says, there is, there is no moral code. You make it as you go. You're a free thinker. No one tells you what to do. Do what you want, how you want, when you want. No one's your boss. You're your own boss. Essentially, then, the sadomasochist who likes to inflict pain and the, and the masochist who likes to receive, pa receive pain, if they became our global leaders, it would be perfectly justified. What Hitler seconds. did was perfectly fine. As a result, when you say that uh, the more, there is no moral code, this in itself is the danger in itself. The next question is to Hassanay Majibali. Just so in the audience that you know, when there are five seconds left, I'm counting down on my hands. I'm not making some strange hand signal to you. <laughs> the question reads, I, as a relatively ignorant bourgeois, believe that I cannot know if God is a reality. Furthermore, by the ethos of my background, to take a stand one way or another would be an act of arrogance. Are you willing to consider the possibility that you cannot know, even if you consider it for a short time? A person who is not endowed with enough understanding comes into that position that he cannot know. And that's a perfectly reasonable argument. And in that state, you have every right to say that I don't know. And to, to limit yourself in the state of suspension when you say, I'm not certain. But that does not preclude the fact that you should not therefore search for it because the evidence is sufficient, plenty of evidence. It's equivalent to saying that we don't know about this theory or we don't know about this existence. That does not say therefore that in the world of science you should not go out and delve into the depths of, uh, of the universe and find it. And that finding of the self is so inherently important in this whole entire discussion. We're not talking about matter out in space. We're not talking about planetary bodies out in space. We're talking about ourselves, our ethical issues. Even Dan agrees with me that we are moral creatures. We condemn. We believe. When you say, I don't believe, we atheists are non-believers. No, you are believers. You are believers in a system. And a system accepts certain things and rejects certain things. To monopolize a word and say, I'm not a believer, in a system of ways. Eric Fromm, who's a, who's a, uh, a philosopher, a German philosopher, said, the question is not whether you are religious or not. I mean, the question is not whether you have a religion or not. The question is, which religion do you have? Rejecting God is a religion. It's a way of life. It, it has its effects on all human beings. That if that person who is an atheist becomes the president, becomes a legislator, he's going to in, in, instill his, his ideologies upon the people. You cannot be a, tra a creature in limbo, floating in space with no ideology. And to take that position every once in a while and say, well, look, I'm not harmful. I'm not doing anything. Well, here, Pol Pot, as we mentioned, uh, Mao Zedong, Karl Marx, millions of people were killed because of that. Millions. Can we say that therefore they were wrong? By whose standards? By their standards as atheists? He said, who can tell me I'm wrong? I don't have any moral codes. I can do what I want. I got away with it, and it's perfectly fine. <coughs> so um, we're going <coughs> to give Mr. Barker a chance to. To say that atheists are unbelievers in God is not to say that atheists have no beliefs in other things Atheists can be uh, fiercely committed and have a belief in the equal treatment of women, for example, and denounce the uh, mistreatment of women in most of the revealed religions. We can have a belief that it's better for humanity if women and men were, were created equal. That doesn't follow that if we don't believe in God, we don't have any beliefs. 
I never said that, so there's another straw man. You also did another ad hominem, Hassanein. You said, to those of us who are not endowed with understanding, which basically is an attack on me, somehow you have more understanding. What do you know that I don't? Is there some secret thing that you know about the world that I don't? You're endowed with understanding, but I'm not. You're the chosen one, and I'm not. You're special, you're blessed, and I'm not. Ten you seconds. have vision, and I am blind. Is that what you're saying? And only those who are blessed with superior vision and intelligence, which is really kind of a self-centered thing to say. But uh, uh, um, ad hominem, Time is up, Mr. Park. Ad hominem uh, attacks are not acceptable within a debate. Thank you. The next question is to you, Mr. Parker. And it reads, if God does not exist, then how do you account for that inner voice that each of us possesses scientifically? How can you explain this? Isn't this beyond our relative realm? Well, an inner voice could mean a million different things. Uh, sometimes when I am stressed from two or three nights of staying up late, sometimes I might hear my mother's voice in my mind. Carl Sagan he said he used to hear an inner voice of his parents talking. It's a natural thing that happens when the brain sometimes goes into certain states. Uh, I know a man who says he talks to Jesus all the time, and Jesus' voice is very clear to him. And he says he's a baritone. He knows that Jesus is a baritone because he hears his voice. So uh, people who hear voices I don't think are good arbiters of truth. Uh, we do have, I don't have an inner voice for morality. I simply have a principle that says Stalin was wrong, not because he broke some code, not because he didn't follow some list of do's and don'ts. Stalin was wrong because he caused harm. That's simple to understand, isn't it? He caused harm. Hitler caused harm. We know what harm is. He didn't have to, and he did. So I can say, based on the relativistic definition of what morality means, we are human beings who want to survive. We recoil from pain by nature. You stick your hand in a fire, you pull from it, right? You don't need some code to tell you, thou shalt pull thy hand from the flames. It's our nature to recoil from pain. So if we're going to use the word morality at all, we're talking about natural harm in the natural world. And I can denounce Stalin. Uh, on that relativistic principle that he could have and did not minimize harm in his world. Therefore, he was what we could call with a lowercase e, an evil person. When you, say, One minute. when you say cause harm, if a man goes to battle and he's fighting and he gives his life for the cause of the greater, he caused harm to himself by his own death, yet we call them heroes. So it's very relativistic when you say cause harm. When you say cause harm, when you're killing something for the greater good, how would, then would you define what is the greater good? You say, no, we don't cause any harm. So if battle takes place between two people, there is harm. Therefore, what do you do then? Do you just simply uh, prevent harm? How would you prevent harm without, without causing harm to the other side? So when you say we don't cause harm, that's a very loose term. It's very, very, uh, uh, as we say, vague. It, it's not applicable. It's not practical. I'm not rejecting that we should stop harm. I'm not rejecting that. But the question is, you cannot apply it on a legislative fashion. You cannot apply it in a social arena. Ten it's seconds. very individualistic, and I think that's where the problem lies. The next question is again addressed to Hassanin Rajabali. It reads, if an atheist offered a reasonable explanation for why the universe exists and for all evidence of design, and for all evidence of design, would you concede that there might be no God after all? You're asking a question which is really an impossibility by its own nature. If you say that there is a reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, answer for no creator, okay, the reasonable answer, first of all, you have to jump over the basic hurdle of asking yourself, how does a relative universe come into existence by itself? Whatever that answer you're going to give me has to be God, whether you want to call it God, whatever the case may be, that supreme power is what we're discussing. How you name it is based on your own perceptions. But the question is that infinite power is a necessity. Anything less than that, it's been created for centuries. Anything less than that is not sufficient. So you are saying that theoretically you would allow for the possibility of an impersonal, transcendent, supernatural force that's not personal. You would allow for the possibility that the universe came into existence by some supernatural means that's not necessarily a, a being that we can worship. You allow for that theoretical possibility then. No. You, see, you just seem to say that. No, I did not. Well, and then if you are saying it is impossible for a non-personal being to have caused the universe, then I say you're begging the question. I am open. If you can give me evidence for, the, for a God, I will change my mind. 
If you can give me evidence for Allah, I will change my mind and will believe in Allah. I will do that. But you have a closed-minded position. You you have boxed yourself into a corner saying, there is. you said it is an impossibility. Those were your words. Therefore, you're not open to truth. You're, you're being dogmatic in your position. Convince me and I'll change Ten my seconds. mind. I've done it before and I'll do it again. And I would like to hear you say the same thing, that you would change your mind if the evidence warranted. I wish we had the cross-examination. We've been... We'll, we'll discuss this. <laughs> sure. Uh, for those of you who still have questions or who would like to now start asking follow-up questions, some questions that have been asked, please bring them up to the front. Uh, Samir is right here. You can all see him. Um, that would make the process much easier. Let's see. The next question is to Mr. Barker. And it reads, You say that science does not know everything. Yet you also say that atheists go by the code of inflicting the least harm. But if you yourself do not know everything, you are not in a correct position to decide what inflicts the least harm. What do you say to that? Well, I said it before. Uh, by definition, morality is the intention to minimize harm. That's what it means. We're not even discussing morality unless we have a definition. So by definition, what do you mean by morality? You can't mean just following orders. You can't take the Nuremberg defense and say, I was just doing what my boss has told me. We have to use our minds. So I said before that most moral dilemmas come when you have a conflict of values, not when you're just trying to decide yes or no on this, but when there's a conflict of values. If your intention is to assess the merits, the relative merits of the consequences of these different actions, and thereby to compute what would be the least amount of harm through those two actions. If that is your intention, even if you fail because we don't know everything, then you can be called a moral person. You might, I, you know, I might commit an act that I think is moral, and, I, and due to my ignorance, I cause more harm. Well, uh, you know, the law looks at intention, right? The law looks at what you intend to do, and uh, I, I will feel horrible if I made the wrong mistake. I would, and I would hope to learn from it. That's what moral education is. We learn from our mistakes. But if my intention was to minimize harm, whatever that means, whatever my level of education and experience and knowledge is of the facts, then I can be called a moral person. If my intention is to increase harm, if that's my intention, to increase unnecessary harm, uh, then I would be called an immoral person. I would be called uh, um, even evil. I don't, I don't like these absolute words, good and evil with capital letters, but we can use them as language tags for the intention of a person to, to create harm in the world where it is not necessary to be created. There are, I agree with you, there are no clear answers either way, but we can legislate morality if enough of us get together, if enough human beings get together and say, we don't like what Hitler did, then we can make laws to try to stop Hitler. There's no big mystery to that. And if enough of us get together on some of these issues that are, aren't such a gray area, let's Sorry, say. Sorry, 10 seconds. Then we can make a legislation, and legislation is fluid in our country. Laws change and they improve over time. But in religious morality, laws have no room for improvement. You say that I'm close-minded. Yes, if you're going to say that I'm rational, I'm using logic, I'm using evidence, I'm using uh, observations, then yes, you might say that I'm close-minded. To answer your question, you mentioned the law. If you say something and it's wrong, well, the law will recognize it was my mistake. You have not defined this law. It's arbitrary. You notice it comes into existence in your mind, then it disappears. It's almost like you're creating it to justify something, then it disappears again. If you say enough people come together and you can justify, so if Germany did what it did, the majority of the Germans believed in the cleaning of the ethnic race, uh, you know, removal of the, the non-ethnic race, then from your moral standards, what Hitler did and his people and what Saddam is doing today in Iraq is, sufficiently, is sufficient evidence to say that they're morally right. And that just begs the question. Thank you. The next question is for Hassanein. Could you please elaborate on the Islamic perspective of evil and hell as a natural consequence of one's own action and not of God's making? Hell is something you and I earn due to our own rejections. And Dan before took umbrage when I said that, you know, when you have lack of understanding, it was never implied that you 
don't take any personal things. As I mentioned to you, there's nothing to take personal here. It's not implying that you're ignorant in any way. We're having a discussion in this matter. And I did not say that. The question was that if I have a lack of understanding, can I suspend? I never said it is you who has lack of understanding, and therefore you've, in fact, you haven't suspended. You've taken a position. To answer this question with regards to uh, the position of evil from the Quranic perspective and from the Islamic perspective, mankind has been endowed with enough evidence and enough gifts for him to reject that system is tantamount to be punished. Just like a teacher who punishes you after having taught you and you fail the exam. That punishment is a natural consequence. No one says, this student failed. Well, you're being unfair. You should pass him. Well, then you're degrading the entire system. For someone to go to hell, understand that there are dimensions. And it's, it's not our uh, uh, platform to discuss it, but I would love to have that discussion on that. But the issue of hell is something that human beings earn. The Quranic perspective is those who go to hell will say it is our own misdeeds. Had we listened, had we obeyed, had we ob accepted what was given to us so prevalent, we would not be the inmates of this punishment. And that punishment is meted out on the basis of the great mercy of God given unto man to live in perpetuity in par paradise. And if someone was to say that this is this carrot that is being called or this golden pot, look, every human being functions in that system. We're goal-oriented. We go to work because we want to get paid at the end of the week. Should we deny that? You're saying deny that. Have no acceptance of any pot at the end of the day. That's preposterous. We are living in this system. If God has created this system and we are within it, it doesn't mean we created heaven and hell in order to provide ourselves the moral codes. Even as a father, you say to your, your child, don't do this, this will happen. Why do you restrict your child from doing that? Because you know there's an impending danger in that. If God is giving us this standard for seconds. us to follow, there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly fine. <laughs> Does it ever occur to you, Hassanain, that if there is a heaven and a hell, and if heaven is getting to live for eternity with the God of the Bible or the God of the Koran, and if some of us have examined the actions and the intentions of that God, we find it to be beneath our dignity as moral people, does it ever occur to you that some of us might prefer hell to living in a heaven with your brutal dictator who creates such harm? Some of us might think that was a moral thing to do. I wouldn't mind spending an eternity in hell if, if, if it was a better moral act. Let him prove what a macho man he is and send me to hell to torture me forever simply for the crime of not believing, in his, for the crime of questioning his motives. So I take my denunciation in hell as a form of a compliment, and I thank you for the compliment. All the good people will be in hell, Mark Ten Twain seconds. and Bertrand Russell and... And Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we're going to have some great conversations while you're up there bowing down before your master lord. I mean, really, think about Time. the choice. I have more dignity Time is up, than Ms. that. Um, this question is for... Okay, um, just a point of order. We'll be finishing up in approximately five minutes or so. We'll have time for, I, I think, one question on each side. No closing statements? Uh, yeah, and then okay. closing statements. Okay. Okay, the question is for Mr. Barker. Many a time we make a meticulous plan, but yet it fails in the last stage. Who overrules your plan? Many times we make a meticulous plan and it falls apart. That happens a lot of times. This debate was one example. We had a few minor glitches. Um, most of us unbelievers are somewhat pragmatic about the world. We know that things aren't going to happen exactly the way we plan them. We're not gods. We don't pretend to have perfection. So we, uh, you know, we don't pretend to be omniscient. We don't pretend to be all-powerful. We accept our human limitations in the natural environment in which we live. And sometimes things will not go according to our plan because we're not all powerful. And I don't care. I mean, as long as I'm intending to do the best I can, if I fail somehow, if the plans go wrong, then I will learn from that mistake. So um, I hope I will learn from that if I'm open-minded. If I learn, that's what happened with Christianity. I preached it for 19 years. And I studied it more closely and I learned, oops, I made a mistake. This is the wrong religion. This isn't for me. And um, Ibn Warak did the same thing with Islam. 
He lived the Islamic life, the Muslim life, and yet he studied it closely with an eye of scholarship and gives excellent reasons for why he changed his mind. Things didn't go exactly as he planned. He thought he was going to be a faithful Muslim his whole life, and he started studying the evidences, started looking at the criticisms. He realized there's something better than this. One minute. It's interesting you say that a person like Ibn Warak takes that position, you know, just because a human being you know, lacks understanding and takes a position that does not imply anything in any way. Uh, when you take, for example, the position that you've taken with regards to uh, the moral codes, but once again, you have not justified a social system. When you say you're promoting this anarchistic ideology that every human being is a free thinker on his own, and as long as 51 people out of 100 sufficiently decide on something, as we call a democracy, it becomes moral. See, that's taking democracy to a higher level where we say it's moral now. And that really is, uh, is deadly in, in its very system. And to say that a person says, well, I have that free thought and things don't go right the way they do, that doesn't mean you abandon. From what I read, Dan, from all your perceptions, in the statement you just Ten made seconds. is this terrible God. You seem to have a lot of anger. And, I, and if that's anger, then I think you should vent it out differently. <laughs> this is... This, this is going to be the final question. It's a two-minute answer from Hassanin and a one-minute rebuttal. Following that, we'll ask the speakers to have their closing arguments for, try to keep under five minutes if possible, okay. uh, for their closing arguments. This final question reads, if there were a God, why would it put people on the earth to waste time? Sorry. If there were a God, why would it put people on the earth to waste their time praying? Waste their time. There is an assumption there that what we're doing is useless, and that in itself is a negating question. A person who prays is praying for his own good. Science has even shown, even those who don't believe in God, that those intercessory prayers and those people who pray on their own, if you study, there is research done that people who are in, in, uh, in the hospital bed themselves, not others praying for them, themselves, okay, have a higher rate of, uh, of, of cure than those who don't. And that means prayer is shown to be a very good entity. When someone prays, it is for themselves. It takes them to greater moral grounds. When a person submits himself and gives himself into charity, into goodness, and, and controls his animalistic behavior and becomes a chaste and a good person, I don't see how you can say that's a waste of time. Prayer is good for the individual. God does not need prayer. Prayer is a means by which to reap the wonderful uh, mercies of God and to negate that is tantamount to disconnecting the jugular vein of the individual. Today, in modern world today, children are not uh, uh, taught about God in schools and look what they're doing. The spiritual, sp humans are made of material and spiritual. You deny the spiritual aspect, they're going to go and fill it up. Today there's, there's a, an, a problem in the United States with devil worship, all types of ridiculous behavior in trying to reach the realm of the unseen. It's a human nature to deny it is to choke it. Therefore prayer is very good and for one to say it's, it's, a, it's a baseless act, yeah, it's, that, that's, that's totally ignorant in a statement. <laughs> Mr. Barker, you have one minute to respond. I mean, my, my point, I'm, but, I'm sorry, the for time a person is to up, pray, what's saying? wrong with it? Mr. Barker, you can have a minute and five seconds. You need to look a little more closely at these evidences. Dr. Richard Sloan and others have done a careful study of these so-called intercessory prayer studies and shown that they are all flawed. Everyone agrees that relaxing during recuperation can help somebody's recovery. No one agrees that praying will re restore a lost eyeball or a lost arm or will get rid of cancer. No, that never happens. But if you are recovering and you need lower blood pressure in order to recover, then prayer in connection with your faith in your community, be it religious or non-religious, like what happened with my wife when she almost died in the hospital. She found support from her community of non-believing family and friends, and that helped her to recover better. And so prayer as a, as a way to try to cajole some some praise glutton of a god to change the laws of nature to my benefit, uh, that never has been shown to work. Nothing fails like prayer. We all know that prayer is a failure, except it can make you feel better and maybe Ten recover seconds. a little faster in some types of, of medical recuperations. <laughs> so you do agree. This, this brings to an end. This, this brings to an end the question and answer session of our program. At this point, uh, both speakers will have an opportunity to present their closing arguments.
I'm asking that you keep it under five minutes, um, both of you. And Mr. Barker, you began, so we'll give you the chance to conclude first. Thank you for sitting through this long event. Great will be your reward on earth uh, for that. Uh, <laughs> as I said in my opening statement, Hassanain, you and I have a lot in common. You and I have virtually identical DNA. My blood could be used as a transfusion to save your life and vice versa. My children could breed with your children. Somewhere back in time, you and I have a common ancestor. Somewhere back. Each of us has been physically cut from our mothers. We know that. We are basically one huge physical organism. You and I truly are brothers in the same species. My dad is a Delaware Indian, uh, the Lenape Indian. In fact, uh, my ancestral homeland is right across the Hudson River here in what is now New Jersey. Before we were forced to leave our homeland because of the Christian European invaders who came over here with a weapon in one hand and a Bible in the other, claiming that it was God's will to chase us off, similar to what the Christian European crusaders did to the, to the Arabs, which I think was morally wrong. They had no moral right to go over there to try to replace one religion with another. And similar, in my own personal opinion, not all, not all atheists agree, but similar to the way the Christian, the, uh, the European Jewish settlers came into that area and tried to claim some religious claim to the land. I think we should stop building these walls. I think we should stop drawing these circles. You have a circle that you're in. You're a respected man and a knowledgeable man in a certain circle in the world. And, but outside of that circle are the infidels, the unbelievers. There's we versus they, us versus them. And those out there are the ones that are our enemies. My mom was also um, uh, part Apache Indian, although she had a grandmother whose last name was Sulphur, which is some kind of a Semitic name or Jewish name. So maybe we have a common ancestor that's closer than we, than we think. Who knows? Uh, her, her parents came from Spain. So it may be that maybe 10 generations ago, you and I had the same you know, ancestral father and mother. That makes us one. The Bible and the Quran apparently are your source of information about this God that you worship. It didn't just come out of the air. You get your information. Those books, if you read them, and I've, I've really enjoyed reading some of the Quran as I've been able to. I'm no expert in it. But they really are, at the bottom, books of war. They are books about us versus them and fighting. The God of those books is the God of war. And I think if there's to be any hope for our world, we don't all have to convert to atheists. It is not my mission to try to convert you to an atheist. I think there's little chance of that happening, right? <laughs> I don't care what you believe. I don't care if you want to believe in all, or if you want to stand on your head and speak in tongues and pray to Mother Goose. I don't care. This is a free world. In America, we have a separation of religion and government, where the government backs off and says, you're free to believe what you like, even if everyone thinks it's stupid or not. Even if you think atheists are stupid and evil. They're free to be atheists in this country, right? We need a, a system in this world where we stop equating religion with government. I don't see what to be gained in my life by believing in a God. I don't see what I get out of it. I don't see what, you know, maybe God is so hungry to be praised. <clears throat> I mean, would you worship me if I stood up and said, you should pray to me every day? Mm -hmm. No, you wouldn't do that, right? You would think I was some kind of a megalomaniacal sick guy who was, wanted to be worshipped and praised all the time with little servants down there who bow down and say, yes, you are great. Uh, you, you know, uh, if there's this deity up there, what do I gain from believing in it? Uh, as I told you, hell doesn't scare me. The threats of punishment don't scare me. I want to live my own life. I want to live it with good natural principles. Uh, I hear it said that religion is a way to offer you to live a good life. Well, here's what we atheists say. If you want to get, live a good life and be kind to others, then live a good life and be kind to others. If I'm motivated to be kind to others by the threat of hell, then that shows how little I think of myself, doesn't it? I need some help to be a good person. I am no good. Or if I'm persuaded to be kind to others by the promise of heaven, well, that shows how little I actually think of others. I'm doing it for selfish reasons. I want to go to heaven. 
I want to be coddled by this daddy up there who's going to make me feel good and give me things. Most atheists and humanists in the world say, let's be good for goodness sake. And to conclude, we have Hassan Rajabali speaking for five minutes. Before he comes to the podium, I'd just like to ask everyone, I heard some whispers going around in the audience. Um, these are the closing arguments. Please have respect for the speakers. Um, they came here to speak, so please, many of you came here to listen. Thank you, Dan, for your, for your closing arguments. I will just make some very quick points here. Uh, First and foremost, what we get in conclusion to this debate is that we see that those who hold this free-thinking mentality, this free-thinking concept of life, are lawless people who essentially, when we say lawless, let me explain. I'm not, I don't want to take it out of, uh, out of uh, perspective. They're not socially bound in any law system. As Dan has mentioned, that um, uh, stop building these walls. Let's break them down. What you're saying is, take all the laws out, take all institutions down, dismantle them because they do nothing but harm. Well, if you dismantle them, are you going to live in a lawless society? Is that what you're promoting? Or are you going to say, dismantle it and rebuild it? Okay, when you rebuild it, you just built a wall again. So which one is, has the higher goal? When you talk about universality of our existence, you say we are the same. Yes, we are the same. And that's the ingenuity of our existence. That if a person is asked to program something where it can take every parameter into possibility, into action, that a person's mind and thought decides to do something with this application, you ask that, you ask that programmer what a harrowing task that is. It's an, it's an impossibility to put all actions together where a person has this completely open architected system where you take atoms and combine them, you shift one molecule over another, change the bonds from one place to another, and it changes its chirality, and it causes harm or it causes good. That universality in itself is sufficient for you and I to submit to ourselves that, wow, it's not so enclosed, it's so universal that we share so much together that it all works in consonance that an, an incredible creator had to put this together for all of it to work together. That in itself is sufficient evidence for anyone. We don't have to get into polemics into rhetoric, into discussions, it is sufficient to see yourself in the mirror and say, wow. To reject that is tantamount to saying, I don't want to see it, and that's fine. It's, it's free choice. So what I'm getting completely from this debate, when it comes to morality, make it yourself. Even you yourself wrote in, on your, on your, uh, in your uh, website, you say, everybody's a free thinker. No one tells you anything. Not a rabbi, not a priest, not a politician, but you didn't add one thing. Not an atheist either. You didn't put that in there because you're saying to yourselves that we should have our own thought and I'm telling you how it should be. But then you should. You've negated your own purpose because when you say you shouldn't impose any law to anybody, then you should not even speak about it. You should be silent and let every man think for himself. But that's not the case. You say the Bible is not... You say that the Bible... Correction. The Bible is not our source. The Quran is our source. The original Bible, which was revealed to Jesus, was a perfect book. It was adulterated. We do not accept it. We accept it as a revelation to Jesus. Jesus was a great prophet. He was a great man, and he, could, he performed many miracles. The Quran upholds it, and we have no doubt in it, no questions. In conclusion, we say the Quran is our litmus test. It is the criterion. It is what decides right from wrong. Science is subject to it. The higher authority, the one who created the universe, has put science into motion. And to take one aspect of the greater and to say, that is my God, is a very foolish statement. You say, I don't care about people praying. Yet I see so much anger in your statement. You say, I don't care if a person wants to do this or he wants to do that, yet you've made so many condescending statements that you're praying to this vicious God or you're, you're fooling around. And people even say they make funny statements about people bowing their heads on the ground. When I read that, it's a clear indication that you're angry. You're angry with something. Rather than have respect for somebody who wants to worship his own God, why don't you say, let him worship? Yet on your website you say, we should, we should forbid religion, I mean, worship of God in, in school. It's a, it's a public uh, place. It, it's our tax dollars. Well, now you are promoting uh, a rejection of prayer in public. See, there you go. You see the actions coming when it comes to the practical indications. When it comes to the individual, in conclusion, the individual knows his Lord. A man comes to our sixth our Imam, Jafar Sadiq and says, he says, tell me about this existence of God. He says, what do you do for a living? 
He says, I am, I'm a sailor. He says, when I travel, I, I, he says, have you had those moments where you've been floating on that, on that piece of wood in your life? He says, yes. Did you have that glimmer of hope? He said, yes. He says, that's your Lord. That's inbuilt into you. I give you an example. My uncle was flying on the, in Air Tanzania and the plane was primarily of Chinese people who were atheists. And the, the pilot says that the gear is not going to land. You know, it's not opening up. So we're going to do a belly landing. And he says, all these Chinese were murmuring something. Anyway, the, the, the gears opened up and it landed properly. So my uncle asked him, he says, what were you murmuring? You're atheist. He says, yes, we're atheists. And what were you murmuring? He says, we were, we were murmuring about that, that hope. That's so my uncle said to them, but you don't believe in it. He said, then we did. <laughs> and in conclusion, in conclusion, when you look at the atheistic perspective, when you look at the atheist perspective, you find that there is no time factor. And in final thing, as you say, he said, let's worship God uh, uh, for the sake of goodness. Let's worship God for the sake of God. Thank you.